Hi there. Welcome to my space of make believe. This is where I take a ride in words to anywhere, be anyone, do anything, and you are welcome to join me. Sui Sin Fa's Mrs. Spring Fragrance was published in 1912. It entered the public domain in August 2020. It is a compilation of short stories centered around the Chinese who emigrated to America and how they tried to fit in with the new world while holding on to their forefathers' values and traditions. If you would like to read along with me, just turn on the captions right over there and you're good to go. Now, let's begin. The smuggling of Taiko. Amongst the daring men who engaged in contrabanding Chinese from Canada into the United States, Jack Fabian ranks as the boldest indeed, the cleverest in scheming, and the most successful in outwitting government offices. Uncommonly strong in person, tall and well-built, with fine features and a pair of keen, steady blue eyes, gifted with a sort of rough eloquence and of much personal fascination, it is no wonder that we fellas regard him as our chief and our bound to follow where he leads. With Fabian at our head, we engage in the wildest adventures and find such places of concealment for our human goods as none but those who take part in a desperate business would dare to dream of. Jack, however, is not in search of glory. Money is his object. One day, when a romantic friend remarked that it was very kind of him to help the poor Chinamen over the border, a cynical smile circled his moustache. Kind, he echoed. Well, I haven't yet had time to become sentimental over the matter. It is merely a matter of dollars and cents, though of course, to a man of my strict principles, there is a certain pleasure to be derived from getting ahead of the government. A poor devil does now and then like to take a little out of this millionaire concerns. It was last summer and Fabian was somewhat down on his luck. A few months previously, to the surprise of us all, he had made a blunder, which resulted in his capture by American officers, and he and his companion, together with five uncustomed Chinamen, had been lodged in a country jail to await trial. But loafing behind bars did not agree with Fabian's energetic nature. So one dark night, by means of a saw, which had been given to him by a very innocent-looking visitor the day before, he made good his escape, and after a long, hungry, detective-hunted tramp through woods and bushes, found himself safe in Canada. He had a three months sojourn in prison, and during that time some changes had taken place in smuggling circles. Some ingenious lawyers had devised a scheme by which any young Chinaman on payment of a couple of hundred dollars could procure a father, which father would swear the young Chinaman was born in America, thus proving him to be an American citizen with the right to breathe United States air. And the Chinese themselves, assisted by some white men, were manufacturing certificates establishing their right to cross the border, and in that way were crossing over in large batches. That sort of trick naturally spoiled our fellas' business, but we all know that Yankee Sharper games can only hold only for a short while, so we bided our time and waited in patience. Not so Fabian. He became very restless and wandered around with glowing looks. He was sitting one day in a laundry, the proprietor of which had sent out many a boy through our chief's instrumentality. Indeed, Fabian is said to have rushed over to Uncle Sam himself, some 500 celestials. And if Fabian had not been an exceedingly generous fella, he might now be a gentleman of leisure instead of an unimmortalized Rob Roy. While Fabian was sitting in the laundry of Chen Ting Lung and Co, telling a nice looking young Chinaman that he was so broke that he'd be willing to take over even one man at a time. The young Chinaman looked thoughtfully into Fabian's face. Would you take me? he inquired. Take you? echoed Fabian. Why, you're one of the bosses here. You don't mean to say that you are hankering after a place where it would take you years to get as high up in the washy-washy business as you are now. Yes, I want go, replied Tycho. I want go to New York and I will pay you $50 and all expense if you take me and not say you take me to my partners. There's no accounting for a China man, muttered Fabian, but he gladly agreed to the proposal and the night was fixed. What is the name of the firm you're going to? inquired the white man. Chinamen, who intend being smuggled, always make arrangements with some Chinese firm in the States to receive them. Tycho hesitated, then mumbled something which sounded like Huang Wo Yuan or Long Lo Tun. 
Fabian was not sure which, but did not repeat the question, not being sufficiently interested. He left the laundry nodding goodbye to Tycho as he passed outside the window, and the Chinaman nodded back, a faint smile on his small, delicate face lingering until Fabian's receding form was lost to view. It was a pleasant night on which the two men set out. Fabian had a rig waiting at the corner of the street. Tycho, dressed in citizen's clothes, stepped into it unobserved, and the smuggler and would-be smuggled were soon out of the city. They had a merry drive, for Fabian's liking for Tycho was very real. He had known him for several years, and the lad's quick intelligence interested him. The second day, they left their horse at a farmhouse where Fabian would call for it on his return trip, crossed a river in a rowboat before the sun was up, and plunged into a wood in which they would remain till evening. It was raining, but through mud and wind and rain, they trudged slowly and heavily. Tycho paused now and then to take a breath. Once Fabian remarked, You are not a very strong lad, Tycho. It's a pity you have to work as you do for your living. And Tycho had answered, Work very good. No work, Tycho die. Fabian looked at the lad protectingly, wondering in a careless way why this Chinaman seemed to him so different from the others. Wouldn't you like to be back in China? He asked. No, said Tycho decidedly. Why? I know not why, answered Tycho. Fabian laughed. Haven't you got a nice little wife at home? He continued. I hear you people marry very young. No, I no wife, asserted his companion with a choky little laugh. I never have no wife. Nonsense, joked Fabian. Why, Tycho, think how nice it would be to have a little woman cook your rice and to love you. I not have wife, repeated Tycho seriously. I not like woman. I like man. You confirmed old bachelor, ejaculated Fabian. I like you, said Tycho, his boyish voice sounding clear and sweet in the wet woods. I like you so much that I want to go to New York, so you make fifty dollars. I know Flan in New York. What? exclaimed Fabian. Oh, I solly, I tell you, Tycho, very solly. And the Chinese boy shuffled on with bowed head. Look here, Tycho, said Fabian. I won't have you do this for my sake. You have been very foolish, and I don't care for your fifty dollars. I do not need it half as much as you do. Good God, how ashamed you make me feel. I, who have blown in my thousands in idle pleasures, cannot take the little you have slaved for. We are in New York State now. When we get out of this wood, we will have to walk over a bridge which crosses a river. On the other side, not far from where we cross, there is a railway station. Instead of buying you a ticket for the city of New York, I shall take train with you for Toronto. Tycho did not answer. He seemed to be thinking deeply. Suddenly, he pointed to where some fallen trees lay. Two men run away behind there, cried he. Fabian looked around them anxiously. His keen eyes seemed to pierce the gloom in his endeavor to catch a glimpse of any person, but no man was visible, and save the dismal sighing of the wind among the trees, all was quiet. There's no one, he said somewhat gruffly. He was rather startled, for they were a mile over the border, and he knew that the government officers were on a sharp lookout for him, and felt, despite his strength, if any trick or surprise were attempted, it would go hard with him. If they catch you with me, it'd be too bad, sententiously remarked Tycho. It seemed as if his words were in answer to Fabian's thoughts. But they will not catch us, so cheer up your heart, my boy, replied the latter, more heartily than he felt. If they come, and I not with you, they not take you, and it be all light. Yes, assented Fabian, wondering what his companion was thinking about. They emerged from the woods in the dusk of the evening, and were soon on the bridge crossing the river. When they were near the centre, Tycho stopped and looked into Fabian's face. Man come for you, I not here, man no hurt you. And with the words, he whirled like a flash over the whale. In another flash, Fabian was after him, and though a first-class swimmer, the white man's efforts were of no avail, and Tycho was borne away from him by the swift current. Cold and dripping wet, Fabian dragged himself up the bank and found himself a prisoner. So your Chinaman threw himself over into the river. What was that for? asked one of the government officers. I think he was out of his head, replied Fabian, and he fully believed what he uttered. We tracked you right through the woods, said another of the captives. We thought once the boy caught sight of us, Fabian remained silent. 
Taiko's body was picked up the next day. Taiko's body, and yet not Taiko, for Taiko was a youth, and the body found with Taiko's face and dressed in Taiko's clothes was the body of a girl, a woman. Nobody in the laundry of Chenting Lung and Co. No Chinaman in Canada or New York could explain the mystery. Taiko had come out to Canada with a number of other youths. Thought not very strong, he had always been a good worker and very smart. He had been quiet and reserved among his own countrymen, had refused to smoke tobacco or opium, and had been a regular attendant at Sunday schools and a great favourite with mission ladies. Fabian was released in less than a week. No evidence against him, said the commissioner, who was not aware that the prisoner was the man who had broken out of jail but a month before. Fabian is now very busy. There are lots of boys taking his helping hand over the border, but none of them are like Tycho. And sometimes between whiles, Fabian finds himself pondering long and earnestly over the mystery of Tycho's life and death. The end. I guess we know Tycho was a woman and no one kind of connected the dots because I don't know why Fabian did not connect the dots even when he said I like you I like man I have no wife well I hope you enjoyed the story thank you so much for joining me today and please do come back for more till next time go grab a book to read or a pen to write and let your imagination take you anywhere be anyone do anything